Hello, everyone. We are back. Uh, let's go to our next talk today. I would like to invite Professor Ricardo Reis from URGS to present the speaker. So, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Thank you again to join us for this uh, 11 uh, IEEE CAS uh, Rio Grande do Sul uh, workshop. So now uh, we have the pleasure to have here Professor Abby Friedman uh, from University of Rochester. So thank you again for accepting our invitation. Uh, it's very nice to have you again here with us. So um, Professor Abby Friedman has a long uh, set of achievements. So we have time here just to, to give some very brief uh, resume of, uh, of his achievements. So Dr. Abby Friedman received the, the baccalaureate degree it's, it's from Ibi. Lafayette College in 79. And it's Ibi. University of California, Irvine in 81 and 89. Uh, all in electrical engineering. From 79 to 91, he was with Hughes Aircraft Company, rising the, to the position of manager of the signal processing design and test department, responsible for the design and test of high performance digital and analog integrated circuits. Has been with uh, the ECE department at University of Russia since 91, where he is a distinguished professor and the director of the High Performance VLSI IC Design and Analysis Laboratory. He's also a visiting professor at the Technion, Israel Institute of Technology. He's the author of more than 500 papers and book chapters, 23 patents, and the author or editor of 19 books in the fields of high speed and low power CMOS design techniques, conductive circuits, 3D integration, high speed inter interconnects, and the theory and application of synchronous clock and power delivery and management. Uh, Professor Friedman was previously the editor in chief and chair of the steering committee of the IEEE transactions on very large scale integration, uh, editor in chief of the Microelectronics Journal, regional editor of the Journal of Circuit Systems and Computers, and a member of the editorial board of several journals, including the Proceedings of IEEE. He is also a recipient of the IEEE Circuits and System Charles Dissor Technical Achievement Award and IEEE CAS Mac van Valkenburg Award, uh, a University of Russia Graduate Teaching Award, and a College of Engineering Teaching Excellence Award. So Professor Friedman is an inaugural member of the UC Irvine Engineering Hall of Fame, a senior Fulbright Fellow and IEEE fellow. So uh, this is just some of the uh, set of achievements of uh, Professor Evi Friedman. Uh, he was also a speaker in our series of uh, uh, events. So you can see another talk in another subject uh, that was done by him that is available in the in the CAS uh, Rio Grande do Sul uh, uh, YouTube uh, channel. So, uh, Professor Friedman, thank you again to join us for this event. So it's a great pleasure to have you here today. So uh, now the floor is with you to start your presentation. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I very much again appreciate the opportunity. Um, happy to answer any questions. I guess um, uh, you'll handle the question, the Q&A part at the end of the presentation. Um, yes, the, the, anybody is invited to write uh, the questions in the chat of the YouTube channel, and then uh, we will read the questions uh, to you uh, after your talk. Fair enough. Um, okay, great. So um, I'm going to talk about on-chip power delivery. Um, it's every chip needs it. It's kind of a nice topic. It's not digital. It's not analog. It's everything. You always need power. So. Um, 
The real topic is how to do this on chip. That's different than um, how to do it in the, in the next generation when, when we have a new world of um, billions of devices. So here's the problem. We have an off-chip converter. Um, we want to bring voltage, uh, we want to bring some power supply in. And it comes in relatively unregulated in, in a high voltage. So we put it onto the board and we have to regulate it. We bring it in from some high voltage uh, down to something that's con consistent with our, our chip. You know, maybe it's getting down to five volts, three volts, things of that sort. Um, and here below is our package. And then we bring it down to the chip level. And what do we see? We see a lot of unregulated voltages that, are, you know, so rather than a nice one volt, here is 1.2, here is 0.8, because you've got all kinds of um, IRR and LVIT drops everywhere. And so you have to regulate it. And so what this talk is about is how to manage the voltage on chip where you can have, con I mean, what's the goal of a voltage? It should be constant. You don't want a variable voltage. A variable voltage is a resistor. You don't want that. What you want is a constant voltage, and uh, it should be as perfectly flat as possible. And so to get that, the main point of the whole talk today is right here. We're going to distribute all kinds of on-chip regulators and converters throughout the chip to make that voltage flat, as implied by the top nice simple box shown here. I assume you can see my arrow. No, you can't. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, let's go, go for it. So today's talk, I'm going to uh, review the basic uh, ideas of power delivery, you know, the past, the present, and the future, talk about how to do power delivery management, then I'll give some examples of different research projects we've done that have produced some interesting results, and then I'll, be, then I'll complete. So where does the power come from? It comes from some power plant, and we want to bring it to our circuit. So you, ha you have this in Brazil, you have it all over the world. So you have some sort of power supply, whether it be coal, oil, hydroelectric, um, nuclear, whatever it may be, um, it gets produced, and then it, and so that gets generated, and then it gets transferred. Wind tunnel, wind, wind tunnel is another example, and it gets transformed all the way through until you finally get to the house. And then if, when you get to the house, in the U.S. is 120 volts. I think in Brazil is 220. Not sure. Um, anyway, the point is that you bring it into the, into, into your to, uh, to the house, and then it gets distributed to the to the computer system, and then it gets further distributed. And here's an example of a board where you have it, the voltage coming in and it gets finally into the actual chips. Um, and then once it gets to the chips, then what do you do? And so there's all kinds of examples in the literature that describes going from the board, seen here, to the chip. And now they have multiple power domains, multiple cores, all kinds of on-chip on power sw switches. These are relatively old. Uh, buck converters, LDOs, all distributed on chip. Um, and here's just different examples, Samsung, um, ST, Qualcomm, showing different kinds of, of their products where they bring on their chips and it's all multiple LDO. So now the idea of having a power supply off chip and all the distribution on chip is changing. Now we have the power supply being distributed on chip. Um, and that's kind of interesting. So we have, again, dynamic voltage control. We have large numbers of power supplies, large numbers of power domains. But classically, the way we design these uh, systems have been relatively ad hoc, not very sophisticated. We just place some power supplies on chip. And so really the point of the talk today is how to do this in a more methodological standard way to offer ideas of how to do on-chip power delivery. So to continue, um, so now we have um, power delivery resources and we wanna talk about what that means. So here's again, here's the old days. We had an or we had these off chip power supplies. They were coming on onto the onto the um to, to the chip, and there might be a few power domains. By by a few old days, I mean maybe five years ago, eight years ago, um, and and that's it. And so the quality was relatively low. We had good power supply, and the efficiency was relatively high um, at the system level as well. But then we thought, hey, let's change. So let's change this. Let's put these put these power supplies on chip, and that's. Where we are today. You saw some examples where we have a few power supplies on chip. And one of the problems with these power supplies, some of the big ones, like the buck converters, are very large and they take too much space. So maybe you only put one or two. Or you might have a couple LDLs, which are pretty small, but they don't have the same efficiency as the buck converters are if you're shifting too large voltage differences. So we had some relatively moderate efficiencies and the quality was okay. So that's where we are today. It's not sufficient. We need to fix that. So where we're going to is this. 
where we, and there's no question we're doing it. So we're going to have many, many, many power supplies on chip, hundreds, uh, maybe more, maybe thousands. As you get into tens and hundreds of billions of transistors, you got to control the power supply. And not just that, you already have hundreds of thousands of decou decoupling capacitors on chip. So you have to merge and integrate the power supplies, these distributed on chip power supplies, LDOs and buck converters now with these decaps. So that becomes the problem. How do you do it right? The good news is your quality is high. Your efficiencies are relatively good in this case. So first, you know, power supply 101 is that there's three primary ones that we use on chip. Switch capacitor, linear or LDOs, and switching or buck converters. The catch is the buck converters um, are very big. They have this big inductor and capacitor. And um, the good efficiency, you can get 85 to 92, 93% efficiency. But... It's a problem. It just takes too much space. So maybe you can put a couple down. Maybe you can't. Um, and then you have these LDOs, these low dropout um, converters. And those are very nice. They're very small. It's just one nice operational amplifier and a power device and a power trans transistor. The catch is that the efficiency is relative to the – it's the output over the input. So if you're going from, you know, 1 volt to 0.4, it's 40% efficiency, and that doesn't work. But if you're only going from – if you're going from 1 volt to 0.9, that's 90% efficiency. That's pretty good. And so that's what people do. They use the buck converters to do the large voltage conversion and the and the linear converters, the LDOs, to localize control of the of the ripple and the, the waveform characteristics. The third type is a switch capacitor. It takes a lot of control. There's some noise issues, and it's not really what I'd recommend for, for this distributed system. So here's where we are. If we do this right, will we simultaneously distribute the decoupling capacitors, the power supplies, a little a few off-chip large buck converters, mostly on-chip, and you see the buck converters and LDOs on-chip. We can get high quality, high power efficiency at the chip level and high system efficiency. And it's all the point. So this is really where we're headed. It makes a lot of sense. Now the question is how to do it. And as a side comment, 3D. I do a lot of work in 3D, and it's just continues to 3D. So you can take these ideas of you know, large buck converters, maybe separate planes of buck converters, um, just for the distribution of the inductors. Um, and then you can do uh, plane to plane conversion. And so there's all kinds of interesting problems at 3D level, which is wide open from a research sense. There's been a few papers, maybe five papers on the topic, but how to, how to do good heterogeneous power delivery at the 3D level is an important research problem, which is, Besides just obvious, straightforward techniques, we need more advanced techniques, and it's going to be a combination of these ideas. Okay, so let's talk about the problem. Um, so here again, I show the you know the, the voltage regulator on the left going to the to the uh, printed circuit board to the package onto the into, onto the chip, but it's not one dimensional. There's all kinds of issues, all kinds of noise issues that come up. Um, I should point out that I, there's a book we wrote a few years ago that kind of covers a lot of this material if you want to see it. Um, the issue is one of complexity. I mean, I always say that the classic problem with VLSI is different than analog and digital circuit design. VLSI is managing complexity. So here's the same case. We have, you know, 100 billion transistors being distributed by this, you know, this power supply, which is essentially one node because the impedances, the output impedances of this, of this, of this uh, distribution network is extremely low. I mean, on the order of milliohms to microohms. So the point is that it looks like, like a node. So you've got one node talking to 100 billion uh, transistors, non-easy problem to analyze. So that's a, that's a problem. We'll talk about that. And one of the issues of the, of the LDL is it does partition the system a little bit. So here's another way of saying the same thing. So, um, so we have this off-chip buck converters going on-chip, being distributed current all over the place. And, see, and you have all these interactions. So you've got LDOs and DCAPs and these billions of load all interacting across this common node. It's a very uh, complex problem. So here's, here's a way to think about the problem. We've got on these chips, several power distribution networks because you've got different power domains. So you might have a one volt system, a 0.8 volt system. It depends how you want to distribute it. Very typically you have an analog power delivery system and a power delivery system for the digital circuitry. And then you're gonna have hundreds of on-chip linear regulators and a few buck converters you can have many, many hundreds of thousands of decaps, and you can have many, many, many billions of loads, all interacting, all sharing this common node. So this is this is the problem. How do you manage it? How do you analyze it? How do you um, design it? 
So this is kind of like a, a nice little simple way to think about it. Here's a case um, where I've got a single um, power supply and three different loads, which transistors. So what's going to happen? Well, guess what? The, the current is going to charge is going to be supplied by that power supply to the various loads relative to their needs. Kind of intuitive. Now, what happens if you have three power supply, two power supplies, and three loads? It's going to share the the uh, the current sourcing, but it's going to be sensitive to the impedances. So in this case, some charge will come from to each of each of the loads will come from the various power supplies. So this is you know, a simple case. Imagine if there's a billion of these loads and hundreds of these decaps. I mean, that's the problem we're talking about. And so let's just take it one one step further, just to you know simplify it. Again, here I've got two decaps. I'm sorry, I've got two decaps, two power supplies, and three loads. I'm sorry, three decaps, two power supplies, and three loads. And we want to distribute charge to those loads. And it's going to come from all the sources that can do it. So the power supply will provide charge, the decaps will provide charge, and the load will receive what it needs, assuming it's designed properly. So that's the problem. How do you actually figure this out, and how do you analyze it, and how do you design it properly when it's billions, not three? So we'll talk about design solutions. And, and really, this is the key slide to, to summarize what I'm going to talk about today. To do this right, to get good power efficiency, low noise, high regulation, that means low ripple, stable systems, handle unusual architectures, you need a combination of solutions. It's not just a better circuit. One of my complaints with the, three, with the uh, on-chip power delivery research world is that there's a thousand people working on a better regulator, a better converter. You know, they tweak the circuit. They make it a little bit better, and they say, aha, I've, I've solved the problem. They haven't come close to solving the problem. It, it, it's important to have a better regulator, but it's, not, it's only a piece of the problem. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So, yes, you need small point of load. So that's an acronym you should see, point of load or POL, point of load voltage regulators. Lots of work being done in that area. But only very little work is being done where you need models to characterize these large complex networks to be able to computationally analyze the entire system. You need algorithms that, that work with these, uh, these models to do fast power grid analysis. And you need to be able to handle all kinds of on-chip and off-chip topologies. And remember, there's a co-design element to this thing where we're working with off-chip and, and on-chip, and they all have to interact together in some one cohesive, one cohesive way. So that's our world. And it's, to do this right, we're going to have, it's going to require a combination of these solutions all working together. So I want to talk about some results in these four areas. Let's start off with circuits. Uh, so we built various different circuits. The key here is size, because we want to have hundreds, maybe even thousands of, of, of these small decaps. And so we built them. This was a while ago. Um, and, and we used feedback in these LDOs to and some uh, pulse width modulator to improve the characteristics and, and enhance the regulation characteristics of these op amps um, with, within the LDO. We use a second feedback path to get to the pulse width modulator. So we or, offer again, this is a new, a new um, uh, uh, circuit structure, like I said, people are working on. And we built it, and we have all kinds of test data. The key concept here it was, it was very, very small. And so we were able to. Um, fabricated, and now that it's small, we can put hundreds or thousands on chip. So, um, and so this is what you see. And we had very good, good current efficiency. It was an LDO, so the voltage, so the, the power efficiency was just the you know, output over the input voltage. But the current efficiency was very, very high. And, and very importantly, it was very, very small. So this is a summary of a lot of different regulators at the time. This is published in this paper here, um, where we basically make the point that this is a very efficient, uh, very tiny. It, it supports the local needs, it's, um, and it, it gives you a very, very um, effective LDO capability. Well, that was a, that was done in 110 nanometers. That was a while ago. So then we started working with Qualcomm, um, and we developed something in their 28 nanometer technology. Um, again, very, very small, very, very fast, low quiescent current. That was important, and very stable under and and under a whole variety of power voltage and temperature variations. And so we built this system for for Qualcomm, it was kind of nice. Um, it was so successful that they actually put it into the product. And and we weren't, that wasn't the original plan. It was just a methodology development effort. But we were able to show very good results such that they put it into their product and they it, it's used. I'm sure people are using that right now on their phones. 
Um, and so I think it was a Samsung uh, phone. So um, again, very aggressive uh, transient specs. We had this large regulated system shown here. We used adaptive tail current. We had, we had RC compensation, and very importantly, it was stable, which I'll review in a minute or two. Um, and here's what it looked like. Um, so we had a power fed. We had the differential amplifier. We had a um, current mirror. This was a classic LDO. Um, we, built, uh, we built it at, you know, with um, TSMCs and Qualcomm Systems. We built it in this technology and very nice characteristics. And as I said, it was very, very small, 85 by 42 square microns. Um, and that's small enough to be able to put a ton down on a chip. Um, and the, the, uh, the experimental results show very, very good behavior. And as I mentioned, um, it made it into a, a, a nice commercial product. Um, models are important. We, um, you have this grid, this large grid. It's, it's nice. That's mostly resistive, but, but, you know, as you may know, um, a tree is pretty simple to, to uh, model and characterize a mesh with its feedback. Not so easy. So how do you model an infinite semi-uniform two-layer mesh? Um, it's all different kinds of structures. Um, we have to, we want to estimate the resistance at it between any two nodes. Um, and so that's what we did. And we show some, we published it here and we show some results. We've actually extended this beyond to much, much larger grids and finite uh, grids, but I didn't want to get into that in this talk. It's, it's a whole talk by itself. Um, but anyway, so um, we, we were able to model, we were able to characterize it in terms of, of the, um, the placement of the decaps and, and we were able to get some closed form expressions for the current that, and the thing is once it's closed form, it's computationally efficient. And that's important because these, these, this problem has a complexity problem. So we're looking at ways to get efficient computational analysis that we, that we can then embed into our, into our algorithms. So we have algorithms. Now that we've got a good model, we, we, bet we develop these algorithms. And here's an example of very nice non-iterative algorithms. Because if it's iterative, it's still computationally expensive. It just takes, you know, this, not any one time, but it's a lots of these different events. So we were able to do it in closed form, non-iterative, and be able to very efficiently estimate the IR voltage drops, and and very and you know that's important. Now that now that I understand my mesh, and I can get a good closed form expression for the resistances and the voltages, I can estimate the IR drop. And so that's a good that's a good solution. So now that I have the ability to characterize these meshes, I want to be able to analyze the, the entire system. So my problem is really a a optimization problem. I want to maximize my voltage drop. I want to minimize my maximum voltage drop while minimizing area, response time, and power, um, and total power. So here's an example where it's 50, half a million individual blocks, large number of devices. Um, so the question should be, the question we're trying to answer is, if I've got a large asymmetric, I mean, it's easy if it's symmetric, a large asymmetric structure, where should I place these power supplies? Where should I place these decaps? Um, I, I care about the output impedance. I care about the current. And I want to be able to get a very low ripple and very very high quality, high, high efficiency. So we applied some algorithms, which, which we talked about a minute ago. Um, and these note that these circuits are very asymmetric. In this case, it's got, it's got you know, more than half a million nodes, which is basically transistors. Um, and we, we dropped a few power supplies between one and 20 and some decaps. And you can see from a, from a very noisy environment, we got to, a, to the red where it's relatively low noise, it's got some ripple, but not too much. Um, and that's this very asymmetric structure. Here's a, a little more symmetric, which makes it easier. Um, 600,000 loads. And we dropped again, one to 20 and two to 32. And now you can see um, the case where it's almost, you know, almost perfectly flat. Down here, it's not flat at all, right? And and we, as we add more power supplies, we have some noise issues, but we decrease it. So now you see the point. This this is a highly symmetric structure, so it's an easier problem, and we get very nice results. Here's a highly asymmetric structure: um, three, 250, 200 quarter, um, two twenty nine thousand transistors, and problematic down here, very problematic, which is a very low voltage, so a big wide voltage range across the chip, but with a few um, decaps and power supplies, it's relatively flat, even this highly asymmetric structure. Um, and another asymmetric example, 150,000 transistors, again, highly asymmetric, 
um, uh, ripple, all kinds of noise voltage problems. And by the time we get to the um, 20 uh, decaps, it's essentially flat. So that's our solution. And this was all published in this paper a few years ago. Here's a summary of what I just told you. Um, the point is that the voltages are much, much less, and you can see it. I mean, the average voltage drive is on the order of, of 5 to 10 millivolts as compared to hundreds of millivolts if you have very few decaps and power supplies. And, of course, with none, you've got a much higher number. So this, this idea works, and it gets very nice results. And, that, and we've offered um, in, this, um, out in this paper, we describe in detail how do you choose where to place those decaps and power supplies. So another interesting element of this problem is the issue of stability. So if I have one power supply hanging off this common node, this power delivery node, um, there's no stability issues. But if I have two, or if I have 100, it gets to be a problem because these um, power supplies interact. And they, when one power supply affects another power supply, and next thing you know, they become unstable. And so what you see is, again, a problem where you can see that, we, I mean, this is a real circuit. Um, where we show the, the phase margin, we can see how it just becomes unstable. Um, and it's not a good set. So it's a negative phase margin, and you get all kinds of instability issues, and it's a problem. So the question is how to manage the stability. Okay, so here's my world. I have these multiple power supplies, multiple, multiple LDLs, all attached to the same node, All and this node is relatively low impedance. Um, the impedance would shield it, but it, the impedance, as I mentioned, in the power grid is very, very small. Um, and you get instability issues where the, the voltage just bounces all over the place based on what, if this LDO is pulling, uh, if LDO2 is pulling a lot of current, it's going to affect LDO6, that kind of thing. So now we've got a problem. So we developed a variety of different approaches to improve the stability, published in a few papers listed here, um, that um, ensures stability if we satisfy a given criterion. Um, uh, for linear time invariant systems, we've showed that it can be arbitrarily um, stable, um, and we developed an expression for that stability, which is shown here. Um, and so that now we know how to wait to ensure stability for these, for this passive, um, we have this passivity stability criterion for complex power grids. And these have all been published in a few papers uh, I, I listed at the bottom here. And here's an example of, um, of an LDO system, a multiple multi-LDO system, all kind, and we, drive and expression, which is shown at the bottom. In the end, we show how we took an unstable system and made it stable by basically moving the poles to the left-hand plane and things of that sort. So, um, and so this is an example of, but so the point is that these power grids aren't just power grids. They're, they're, they're a multi-feedback system that can affect the stability of the active components. And that's something you have to care about. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk, now that's kind of a background. And now I'm going to talk about some various research problems that we've solved. Um, we did a lot. I do a lot of work in 3D, and so one example was a 3D power delivery system. Oops. So here's just an example of some some various 3D chips um, we've done over the over the years. But I'm going to talk about this one on the right, the power delivery chip. And it's got four boxes. This the, the top left was a was a rectifier, and the, the rest were these power delivery systems, which we del delivered across three planes. Um, so the issue, and we published it in this JSSC paper a few years ago, um, and the question was how to generate and how to distribute the, um, the, the power across this multiplane, multiple, you know, hundreds of uh, TSVs. This is a heterogeneous system. It's not monolithic. So it's, it's got a, a classical full example of a, of a 3D system. Um, and we, it, was, it was foundried by MIT. It was paid for by Dopper. They had this test chip. You can actually see it where this is a line that kind of goes across here. These are all the government internal test chips, and these are all the external. Here's my test chip here. Um, other people have their own test chips. Some worked, some didn't. Um, so, uh, and here's the chip blown up, of course. So uh, it was a 150 nanometer fully depleted SOI, uh, three planes, three metal layers per plane, backside metal in two planes, and each wa wafer was processed separately. The TSVs were one quarter micron, which is not the smallest, but pretty good. Um, and there were the planes one and two were face to face bonded, and planes two and three were uh, back to face bonded. And again, here's the three, the four blocks. We um, we, we just talked about the the um, the, the um, these three blocks one, two, and three. You'll see that um, we had three different um, 
mesh structures across them, interdigitated power ground planes on planes two and three, and lastly, fully interdigitated. So we have different, uh, we, here on the left is on the periphery here, it was within the block. We, we're looking at different ways to distribute the current inside these 3D planes. We, had, we also, interestingly, we had to generate noise Otherwise, we wouldn't. It would all look the same. So we we had an on noise uh, on chip noise generator for each of the um, structures, so that we could compare these various um, topologies, and we show that um, the different kinds of noise, both in the power network and ground network, all good experimental results. Um, we had noise generators which operate at different frequencies, so you can see the noise coming out at those frequencies. And this is with um, board level decaps. This is without board level decaps. And you can see the difference in, in how the decaps made a huge difference, um, despite the fact that we had this, these noise generators. I mean, look at look down here at these lower frequencies. Um, so uh, good results. We have the, uh, the, the, the time domain analysis of the power noise. You can see it relatively flat and under different conditions. And um, it's, so you see real re experimental results of these structures. We looked at the average noise for the three blocks with decaps, without decaps, we, should, we got almost 80% reduction with the board level decaps. We noted that the planes with TSVs and dedicated power and ground planes propagate the least amount of noise, um, followed by the, the higher TSV density block. We um, Here's the peak noise. Um, again, um, uh, good results with and without decap. We did. We even did it without with with uh, under different temperature conditions and things and so, and so on. But this is a summary, if you really want to see all the data, you go to the paper. If you really, really, really want to see all the data, you go to the dissertation, which I can point to. Um, okay, so that was one result that's worth mentioning. Um, now we've done a lot of work in on-chip voltage regulation um, on, on, on the system at level. These are typically with various companies and so on. Um, so one idea was to distribute not 5 volts or 3 volts, but a high voltage and see, and see how you can reduce, enhance the system power efficiency by, by lowering the distribution losses across the chip. And so you worry about the power loss between the, the voltage regulator and the load. And so we offered, there were two issues, which was how to build the voltage regulator in the package, which I'm not gonna go too much over today. But the other issue, you've got these high voltages, it's gonna generate a lot of signal out there and it's gonna be um, recognized as EMI or electromagnetic interference. So we actually had to worry about managing the EMI of the resident of the converter. Um, so here, so in this case, we distributed 48 volts, trying to get down to one volt, 1.2, onto the package and onto the chip. We had very high current densities, um, 100 to 150 amps. We had all kinds of uh, power state impedances, a lot of power loss, 10 to 20 watts. So we, 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 had, we needed a very good package. We needed a high number of layers. Um, and we developed it with, with, uh, with, the, with the various companies we were involved with. Um, and so we developed this point of load um, voltage regulators around the CPU, distributing very uh, much lower voltages, and we were able to manage the current, get lower efficiency, but we had to worry about these regulators. How do you go from 48 volts down to 1.2? So um, so we recognized there was going to be all kinds of electromagnetic radiation um, from these uh, EMI sources, which are the point of load re regulators, and basically there are, there's going to be a tennis, uh, essentially receiving all this noise, and we had to manage that. that. So. We wanted to improve the power integrity, uh, reduce worry about the wor signal integrity and the sensitivity of these circuits. So we offered an, an uh, a, a not a standard converter. I mentioned earlier there are three classical converters, well, there's all kinds of converters. And the one we looked at was a sinusoidal resonant converter called an SRC. It's transformer based, which means you don't want to put it on a chip, pretty much. Um, and we, we, it's the current generated from an LC tank. Um, the, the harmonics are relatively controlled, it's relatively low EMI, um, and less than 4% ripple. And what we did is we we played with it, and we had a multi-SRC with a very high turns ratio. We evaluated the various EMI characteristics. Um, we showed that it could produce the right voltages, and it was um, much lower EMI um, using this, this, this structure. So we basically developed a new architecture, which we called a distributed sinusoidal resonant converter. We published it in a few places. It had very low EMI, less than 3% ripple, and we would optimize each of the transformers to produce the lower EMI. And that was a good successful result we could build on, on the package. We did a lot of simulation to show, and here's a good place to find the results in this publication. 
uh, about a year ago. Uh, a single stage SRC, a distributed SRC, and you can notice how much lower the, the EMI is in the right hand case where we distributed the SRC rather than having a single stage. Um, and we actually built it, which is great. And so we, here's an example where we could show the much lower EMI. So you're supposed to compare the right hand picture here to this picture. And you can see the EMI at 120 megahertz was relatively low based on this distributed SRC. So that was a nice result. Um, and, um, and, and I want to make the point that e e electromagnetic interference has two perspectives, has the aggressor and the victim, so and the medium, to be fair. And so the point is that you can play with the aggressor or you can play with the victim, and they're both the right approach. And this is true in any noise environment, not just EMI. You always have to worry with how you, the, the aggressor, with the victim, and the medium. And that's true in, you know, the coupling, noise, and all kinds of noise. You have to worry about the source, the load, and how you transfer it. Okay, that's one example. We did another work with another organization. In this case, um, it was with IMEC in, in Belgium, um, where we um, were worried about an issue which we normally call the resistivity wall. Um, and so, because as you shrink dimensions, what's happening? It's not getting more inductive, it's getting more resistive. So I mean, this is a different talk, but you know, the old days it was capacitive and then it became resistive and then it became inductive and now it became resistive again because the lines are so thin. And, you know, and the resistive time constant is being down the inductive time constant. So the solutions that we need, I only, you know, this is a long talk. I only give a few slides, but we can look at ways to mitigate the effect. We can look at better materials, typically graphene of some, some sort of carbon-based material. Um, we look at um, this, and you have to break down the problem into the, into the, the global grid, the local area, the via stacks, all kinds of ways of, of do, do, doing it. And we looked at in 14, 10 and seven nanometer technologies, all um, built at, at IMEC in, in Luvon. Um, and we showed, and this is interesting, at different nodes, the source of the noise is different depending upon whether it's global, local, or via. So it's dominant at the local level um, at seven nanometers, at the global level at 14 nanometers, but at seven nanometers, the via is starting to kick in. So this is interesting. So the classic image of how to manage the noise characteristics of the entire power grid is dependent upon which part of the grid you're talking about and at what technology node you're thinking about. So at seven nanometers, and this is going to get only true more so at five and, and, and two nanometers, which is, you know, in research today and development today, um, this component, the local component, the VIA and local component are going to expand and, and they won't be dominated anymore by just the global component, which is interesting. Um, and we show different kind of solutions um, that we that we developed. We have, here's in the right side. We've got copper we've, uh, carbon techniques. We use multiple stripes and just you know trying to short the impedances and all kinds of ways and to um, to manage the noise. And you can see they work differently for different nodes, which is again important. So um, this is all summarized in this paper here, um, relatively long paper, and um, and you can see how it's different based on the various noise sources going. And, and you're dealing, you have to remember, you're dealing not with three layers of metal like I had in that 3D chip, but now you're dealing with a dozen layers of metal and it's going even more so. And so to get from layer one, get from the transistors to metal one all the way to metal 12 or 13, there's a lot of vias there and there's a lot of resistances and therefore there's a lot of IR drop. And so now you have to worry about, and we're not talking about 3D TSVs, we're talking about um, complex two-dimensional chips with a dozen layers of metal, and you got to get up. And each V is going to give you somewhere between two to four ohms. And two to four ohms adds up. And so how that affects the noise characteristics is important. And that's what that's what this, the point of this, of this result is. And I just wanted to summarize that. Um, so, get, oops, wrong way. Um, okay. So a, a more researchy topic. I, I want to kind of move from some of the classic problems to some ideas that we've developed. Um, and so you've all, I believe you've all heard of something called a network on chip where you've got these various um, cores uh, communicated by this common, so rather than having a data bus, we have the, this network of cores uh, all communicated by these by these crossbar switches or some kind of switch, um, and it controls the data flow between and among the cores. Um, well, we, we've taken this idea and we've developed our own concept called a power network on chip. So a way to distribute current to each of these cores in a controlled fashion has high power integrity, good efficiency, highly scalable, which is important as we go into 100 billion transistor systems, 
and relatively good quality of power. So this is an idea that we've invented that we think is important. Um, we've published it in a few places. We now have developed our own, um, our own power network on chip. Again, you need circuits, models, algorithms, and architectures. It's dynamically adaptable, the re these regulators. So you can actually change it on the fly based on what on, on, on the on the, the commands from the various points of the grid. You can control the efficiency and the losses. You can control the quality. And once again, it's it's a combination of, of, the, whole, of the entire system. And so we've developed this structure. You can have simple um, routing te technology. You can have extremely complicated routing technologies where you have all kinds of sensors and switches, microcontrollers. So this, I'm, here I'm referring to these to these gray boxes here, how you want to build those boxes. Or you can have a simple, just a simple regulator. Um, and it's, you can control it in time. You can have the and very large switches. You can control the efficiency. So there's uh, a lot of work in this area of how to um, control these the, this PNOX system as a whole. Um, you can have a dedicated and, um, um, and multi-source shared power grid. Um, so um, again, you show a, de here's a dedicated structure on the left. Um, uh, here on the right is this a large structure, and um, and you can have different power routers going talking at different time, times. So you can manage the flow of the current, not just structurally and and functionally, but also in time. And this and this is a nice paper here that we a relatively long paper that we described it in detail how this works. Um, and we did case studies uh, using IBM benchmark circuits. Showing how it you can actually control the power domain at different at different times and 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 so on and and we applied it for different uh, technologies and we use DVS as well and so it's an interesting approach it's something that's not been done and I'm hoping someday it'll be um, uh, people will I think it came out really early in time I'm hoping someday it'll be picked up in some serious way as a complement to normal NLC okay so um, so I'm moving forward so here's um, Here's the basic core idea. We've got circuits, we've got models, we've got algorithms, and got architectures. And to do the problem right, to, to do a paradigm shift in how we actually manage the power delivery and how we actually support, I mean, this new world, we, we can't use the old fashioned wor wor world of one big mesh and you know, a few topping points to get down to the various, um, um, various power domains. We need to do it in some cohesive methodological way where we actually understand what we're doing. We've offered the PNOC as one example, but, um, but in all these cases, we need to think about how to do it. So, so here's the PNOC uh, overview. So let me just go over some research ideas and topics that, that are just to kind of tease you with, and then I'll, I'll be ready for some Q&A. Um, so again, trends. We, we're getting very, very sophisticated power systems. We have adaptive power management. So these days you see a PMIC, power management IC, separate from the chip. That's how complicated. People developing their own PMAC chips. We have applications like cloud computing, which are, of course, big data, which is requiring all kinds of large-scale power distribution. And let's not kid ourselves. These data centers are chips. I mean, they might, they're big racks of, of boards and all that sort of stuff. But in the end, they're chips. And we need to make sure that we distribute the current properly around those chips and the racks and the boards. Um, we need to be able to develop good optimization techniques and, and algorithms to manage these chips. We need to recognize that the application spaces and the technologies are in, are developing. 3D integration, I've already hinted at. You got SIP, system and package, which is changing the way we distribute the power delivery problem. You put the inductor in the package, for example. I mean, you don't want us to put that on chip. FinFET technology and, and all gate around, you know, all around gate kind of structures. You've got NTC, near, near threshold um, computing kinds of design methodologies affecting how we design our system. You've got new kinds of, of interconnect structures. We're not talking about data buses anymore. Networks on chip. And so it affects how we do the entire problem. Um, one point I always like to make, and I'm a big, I spend a lot of time on clocking, um, is that the power and the clock, albeit different problems, are completely related. You, what you do in the power affects the clock. What you do in the clock affects the power. What you do digitally affects the what, what happens in analog and vice versa. I mean, every time you got a high switching clock, it puts noise on your digital re uh, structure. Every time you vary the digital signal because of IR noise, it affects delay inserting in the clock lines. So you have all kinds of issues um, between the power and clock. And so you can't treat them in, uh, independently. You need to recognize that they affect each other um, and that, and not just analog and digital, but clock and power. And they're very loosely coupled and you need to handle them in a cohesive, integrated way. 
So simultaneous co-design is my point. 3D, all kinds of structures on the on these on these cubes. I call them cubes. Um, uh, digital data processing, optical distribution. You've got antennas. You've got all kinds of sensors, and you might have a um, onto power management mo a module for the entire 3D cube. So the question is, how do we design, model, simulate, verify, and test these complex 3D systems, including the power management um, issues? And as I say, we've got all these emerging devices and technologies. Um, you've got power speed walls that are constraining us, technology constraints, noise constraints. You've got all new kinds of technologies, resistive memory, magnetic memory, Spintronics, carbon nanotubes, graphene, multi-gate devices. You've got new kinds of platforms and packages like 3D integration, system package, you know, um, on-chip optical uh, interconnects. These are all coming together, and we have to support this with a proper uh, power delivery system. So these are pure research problems that there are no uh, obvious and good solutions, but will keep us busy for a little while. So to summarize, um, um, the problem of doing the key to doing power delivery on chip it's not just it is important but not just a better circuit which is my complaint with this whole field is that they've only focused on better fancier tweaking different circuits you also have to look at models algorithms and architectures and combine that together and one of my research topics these days is combining this all into a cohesive system that can drive the entire problem not just a better algorithm or a better model or understand the architecture but having a solution that can solve it all together as one result. And again, I'll point to my, my latest edition of this book, which talks about a lot of these issues. And I think with that, you asked me to do this in 45 minutes, I did it in 46, um, I think I'm done. Can you hear me now? Okay. So thank you very much for your nice, interesting talk. So now it's time for questions. So if you want to do a question for Abby, please do it as soon as possible using the chat channel. Um, right. So uh, we have a question here by Gessel Assumpção Jr. So chips with extra secrets. Uh, spare columns in memories or space cores in multiprocessors right. can have better yields. Would this be possible for the power distribution as well? Right. So, right. So the question is, is redundancy. Can you apply redundancy to uh, to this? Um, it's tricky. Um, so first place, um, you know, so how do you manage redundancy? Often you have switches. Um, and the switches are, what are they? They're, they're resistive paths. And so now you're talking about putting a very large resistor in a um, in a redundant power delivery system, and so that makes me nervous when, when I hear those kinds of concepts of using um, of using switches um, uh, with resistive paths. So, so so in principle, the answer is yes. You could have first place. You can have multiple domains, right? You can have multiple power grids. You can definitely do that, but um, but. To do it right, um, you need to worry about how, and, if, and to do redundancy properly, you need to be able to control the on and off points, and that ends up putting a large resistor, you know, between along a path. Now, if you make it sufficiently large and you and you basically shut down a path, I'm not saying you can't do it. It's something that I've not seen done, um, and there are flags that I worry about. But maybe there's ways of pushing such a large high impedance that there won't be any current flowing and it'll force it to another path. But I worry about it. I, I I haven't done it, and I haven't seen any work on it, and I'd be worried about how you handle the switching. Other questions? Okay, uh, so I see no more questions for the moment here in the chat, but I have one. So um, about the power distribution, can you comment about um, the distribution of the power using the top metal layers versus the local distribution using metal one so right right so yeah um so what happens you know you got half a dozen to a dozen layers what happens is you know power and ground go on top clock goes next global lines go next and then semi-global then local all the way down to layer one so i mean that's a cliche way of doing it um the the catch is that um and i've actually written some papers on 
on those on those on this very issue of how to distribute within those multi layers. Um, you, um, I mean, what people basically you, it gets inductive. Um, so in these really wide lines that we that we build for um, for the power lines on the very top, where they distribute a large amount of current, we made it so wide because we worry about electric migration and other kinds of issues that the impedances are so small that, well, I'll say the resistances are so small that the inductive characteristics kick in. And so you have to worry not only about LDIT, but also you have to worry about um, about in, in, uh, inductive coupling and things of that sort. So so anyway, to zeroth order, you would put the local interconnect and the local distribution at the lower levels. And you put the global power and ground at the highest levels. That's the, the the first step, but you also have to worry about the impedances. And so, I mean, I, I've shown I, 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 I in my in my class actually, which I teach, um, I have a whole lectures on power delivery. Um, I, sh I have a graph which I could show could have shown here, which um, shows that um, that you need need to manage where the power where the current flows. And if you don't watch out, it flows in the wrong layers because the impedance path is a function of frequency. So at very high frequency. Those inductances become important. At lower in frequency, they're not. And so the current's going to flow in the different layers of metal based on the frequency your signals were operating at. So this is a little tricky. But so at low frequency, they're going to do what you think. Well, they're going to go up into the highest levels because the resistance is low and the inductance is unimportant. And it's going to flow. And so people design their systems as if it was a low frequency system. But if your system is operating at, say, a gigahertz or 10 gigahertz or 20 gigahertz even, what's going to happen? That inductance is going to look like a, like a very high impedance and that resistance won't look so bad. And so now a lot of that current is going to flow down to the lower levels, which are thinner and going to have electric migration problems. So one of the points I've made in my, my, my graduate lectures um, is that you don't want to have too much variation between, between your upper layers and your lower layers because of this frequency dependence of where the current's going to flow. It's going to go, the current's always going to flow wherever the impedance is lowest. That's a fact. But the impedance is going to change as a function of frequency. And therefore, you need to worry about your, your operating frequency and how that, and the harmonics in those signals, which will change where that current flows relative um, to the various lines within the power grid. So it's actually a very complicated structure. And I have a, a TVSI paper, which I published maybe five, six years ago, that kind of covers this in relative detail, which I would recommend looking at if you're interested. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, another question related to this is uh, about the problem of uh, the drop of uh, power uh, in the tower of vias between the upper layers and the metal one. All right, you're saying the TSV? Yeah, the vias. Right, it's a real problem. I mentioned that already. So. Um, yeah. So you have these 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 vias are typically between two and five ohms. Your output grid is you know hopefully milli ohms or micro ohms. So what happens when you put twenty ohms in, in a serial path with your grid? So it's a huge problem, and so you have to take that into account in your design. So what people are do um, is they use dotted contacts, which means they have a bunch of contacts in parallel in series, um, just all collected um, to lower the impedance. They, I mean basically. What you do is you spend area. And so you spend all kinds of area to make the the, TF, the, the via resistances very, very small by having all sorts of parallel structures. Um, and, um, and, that's, and that's the best you can do. If you do, if you, and you need to make sure in your, in, your, um, in your power lines, your very wide power lines. And one of the problems is you can't have a large via anymore because, you've got, because if you do that, your etch rate for the large via and the small via are the same. Which means you're gonna when you etch these large vias, you're gonna etch really badly into the small vias into the lower metal layers. So they use what is called dotted contacts, where they have a series of, of small, minimum-sized contacts all collected into one region to lower the um, the impedance of the TSVs by placing them in parallel. That's a solution. There's lots of other solutions. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So another question is um, uh, you talked about the 3D chips now, where uh, the the power uh, dissipation is one of the problem between tiers, no? Uh, but do you have some comments about uh, the problem of uh, power dissipation in monolithic 3D chips? 
That's the classic question. I I give lots of talks in 3D. That's always the first question. Um, my 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 official response goes like this: um, power density and power dissipation in the 3D cube, particularly monolithic, um, is a huge problem, and you have to take it into your design problem world. So, in other words, um, you know, we all design our circuits to lower the speed, to, to increase the speed, to lower the power, to improve the reliability, but but we, now we have to manage the power density as well. And so there's all kinds of ways and tricks to lower the power density where you trade off speed, area, and power. So, um, and so we have to, so when you design these 3D chips, you have to take into, this into account in your, in, your, in your design process. I mean, you know, people always talk about scaling and when are we going to end? Well, the answer is we're not going to end. We're just going to flip vertically. And so instead of scaling and tra having smaller transistors, we're going to have hundreds and billions and trillions of devices all packed vertically. Well, that sounds great, but now you have the power density problem. So to enjoy the advantage of a trillion transistors, you have to change the way you design. And you have to lower your speeds, you have to control your, what you do, and you have to top, I mean, you gain performance by having a trillion devices. So you can't, have, you can't be greedy is what I'm really getting at. You can't have 10 gigahertz frequencies and a couple trillion devices in a 3D system and expect it to not burn up. So um, so you have to lower your frequencies. If you, I mean, and you can gain all kinds of performance by multi-core approaches and serial approaches and things of that sort to gain performance, um, you know, both in parallel and serial structures to allow you to gain what you want. The trick is you're going to have to manage how you design and not get greedy unless you're willing to put this 3D chip in a refrigerator, which is another solution, which people do do um, for certain kinds of applications. That's okay. the right. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Ben. It was a great talk, and uh, thank you very much, you, again, to accept our invitation. I hope to see you in in a face-to-face -face, uh, meeting. Oh, maybe maybe Iscas in um in uh, next spring. And I think that's good. Yeah, be, I think it's I hope so. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Take care. Be well. So, nice. so uh, I give it now the floor back to Alexandra to. Do some new un other announcements. Okay, thank you, Professor Ricardo. Uh, many thank yous, Abby, for a very nice presentation.